Hi Physics 1, welcome back to week 3 of Physics. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about unit vectors and a couple of important trig identities that we're going to use a couple of times this year. We already have a way of talking about something that's just the size of a vector. We called it the magnitude. We noted it like this. We have vector v with its little vector arrow. The magnitude of vector v was with double absolute value signs around it. But a vector isn't just its magnitude or its size, it has a direction as well. And in order to talk about that, we want to talk about its unit vector. So the unit vector has a special notation. It's the same letter, vector v, but now it has a little hat over it. Sometimes we call this v hat, or just uh, the unit vector v. The unit vector is a vector that has a length of exactly one. one unit in whatever units you're interested in. Uh, and for that reason it talks more generally about the direction the vector is going in than whatever length it has. You can imagine having unit vector v be in exactly the same direction as our regular vector v but only having a standard unit length. So in that way we talk better uh, or more specifically about the direction a vector is going in. A couple of examples of unit vectors are something like well just plain east or north or west or south or what have you or you could be more specific and say 144 degrees counterclockwise of plus x which is kind of what we would say. Something like that would look like with the xy plane here it would look like, well, here's 0, 90, 180, so 144 is something like this. And then there is my unit vector with a length of 1. Uh, just as a fun note, a friend of mine in graduate school had a special baseball cap he got, I don't know where, but it had on it a little uh, unit vector notation. And the way you say it, of course, is a hat. So he had a hat that said a hat on it. Being gigantic nerds, we thought it was the funniest thing in the universe. There are a lot of trig identities that are pretty useful. Instead of teaching you every single one, though, I'm going to look at them as they come up in class. There are only three that I really want to talk about today. The Pythagorean identity, the law of sines, and the law of cosines. So first we want to talk about the thing called the Pythagorean identity. And you're going to notice it looks a bit like the Pythagorean theorem. First off, I'm going to write down the identity itself, and then we're going to go about proving that it's true. So the Pythagorean identity is sine of some angle squared plus cosine of some angle, the same angle, squared as equal to 1. And I want to be careful about this notation here. When I put the little squared here above sine, what I'm saying is sine of theta times sine of theta. I'm not really sure why this is the notation is standard instead of saying just like sine of theta and then squaring that whole thing, maybe putting it in brackets. But this is the way you write it here. Um, so all that it means is that you take the sine of theta, it'll give you some number, and then you square that final number that you get. Uh, don't worry if it's a bit confusing, I can clarify further later on. So this is the Pythagorean identity itself. We want to prove that it's true. And we're going to prove it by looking at a right triangle. So let's say we have a right triangle here. Uh, here's angle theta. Opposite of angle theta is, I'm going to say, side A. Adjacent to angle theta is going to be side B, and then we're going to have H for the hypotenuse. So just by the definitions, sine of theta is going to be side A over hypotenuse. Cosine of theta is going to be side B over hypotenuse. Okay, so if we go back to this definition here, this left side, sine squared plus cosine squared, I'm going to plug these definitions in. 
So sine squared is a over h squared, that whole quantity squared. And cosine is going to be b over h. And I'm going to square the same thing, b over h. And if I uh, try to figure out what this equals, I'm going to have to square both things inside the parentheses here. So a squared over h squared. Uh, and I do need to remember to say equals 1. I'm trying to prove that this equality is true. b squared over h squared. Well, I have an h squared in both denominators here. So I can multiply everything through by h squared. So times h squared times h squared times h squared. I'm going to get a squared plus b squared equals h squared. Well, if I'd used the variable c, you could see this very simply. This is the Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared is the hypotenuse squared. And we know that this is true. So we have just proved that this equality holds. So there, my friends, is the Pythagorean trigonometric identity. So the next two things I want to talk about are called the law of sines and the law of cosines. And they're really useful for any triangle. It doesn't have to be just a right triangle. I mean, it can work for right triangles as well. So to find the law of sines, to derive it, we're going to start with just some random triangle here. I'm drawing not very well. I'm going to label the angles with capital letters A, B, and C. And the opposite uh, sides from those angles are going to have lowercase letter uh, of the same letter. It's pretty standard for how to do triangles. I'm also going to drop down a, a, a height here that's perpendicular, H. So now we have two right triangles, uh, A, H, and there. So um, the sine of angle A is going to be H, the opposite leg, over this hypotenuse of this triangle. So it's going to be B. And the sine of angle B in the other triangle is also going to be H over now angle A or side A, I should say. We can actually get this uh, manipulated to be equal to each other if we say in this one, well, I'm going to multiply both sides by, by B, so times B times B. The B's here are going to cancel out, and what I get is B sine A equals H. And down here, I'm going to do the same thing with A. A sine B equals H. And since they're both equal to h, I can set them equal to each other. b sine a equals little a sine b. And this is pretty close to the law of sines. I just need to rearrange to have all the a's on one side and all the b's on the other. So I'm going to divide this by b, divide this by b. So I'll have sine of a equals a sine b over little b. And I'm going to divide this side by a just to get rid of this a. And I have to divide this side by a as well. So what I get is sine a over a equals sine b over b. That, my friends, is what's known as the law of sines. You can show a similar thing for sides c and angle c. And actually show that these are also, both of these are also equal to sine big c over little c. Uh, Sometimes it's written inverse of this, where you have little a over sine a, little b over sine b. It's still equivalent. The next one I want to do is called the law of cosines. And it's going to start with pretty much the same triangle here, although you'll notice I changed around where the letters are. It shouldn't make a difference, but I wanted uh, to have something nice at the end, so I had to change around where the letters are. Um, and there are going to be multiple versions of this one. Uh, I'm going to now break up this, this bottom line, which I'm now calling B, this long baseline, into two parts. One from angle A to where that vertical drops down. I'm going to call that X, meaning that the remainder of this side B is going to be B minus X. Not so terrible so far, right? I'm going to start with the cosine of angle A over there. And the definition of cosine is 
adjacent leg over hypotenuse. So in this case, it's going to be x is the adjacent leg to angle A. There's our angle A. And then C is the hypotenuse of that little right triangle. So it's going to be x over little c. And if I want to figure out what x is here, I'm going to multiply both sides by c. So x, our little unknown, is going to be c cosine a. And I'm going to put a little dot there to remind myself that it's multiplication. The uh, Pythagorean theorem for triangle um, a, b, and then whatever this point is, is going to give me uh, x squared plus h squared is equal to c squared. And I'm going to want to reinforce that little x. Uh, and I want to solve for h here because it's going to be useful later. So h is going to be c squared minus x squared. Okay. Also, I want to look at the Pythagorean theorem for the other triangle, this, this other right triangle here. So from c, b, down to whatever this point is here. That's going to be uh, b minus x as a quantity squared plus h squared is equal to a squared. Could be worse, right? And again, I'm going to want to solve this. Um, I guess I don't have to solve it. I have h here. and I can just put it straight in. So if I sub this h straight into that h, this h squared here, into that h squared, what I get is this quantity b minus x, quantity squared, plus c squared minus x squared, that was our h squared there, is equal to a squared. Uh, what I want to do here is I want to actually foil out this square in parentheses. So I'm going to get b squared minus 2bx plus x squared. And then I'm going to be adding c squared minus x squared equals a squared. Really nice for us, these two x squared cancel each other out. So there's a plus x squared and there's a minus x squared. Those go away. That is super helpful for us. What we're left with is b squared minus 2bx plus c squared equals a squared. I'm going to arrange a little bit. I got um, b squared plus c squared, and I'm going to have a minus 2bx equals a squared. And final thing is I'm actually going to substitute in this definition of x here that we found in the, in the beginning all the way down for us into this x. So what I finally get, if I rearrange this just a little bit, is a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2b, and now here's x, c cosine of a. And that is what we call the law of cosines. You'll notice that it looks a little very similar to the Pythagorean theorem, a squared equals b squared plus c squared. And it actually, if we're really clever about this, um, if this angle a is a right angle, if it's 90 degrees, then this whole term goes away completely and we just get back to the a squared equals b squared plus c squared. If you plug in cosine of 90 in your calculator, it'll be zero. So this whole term just disappears in that case, which is super nice. There are other versions of the law of cosines. I'm going to write them down for you. They have, they're derived in exactly the same way as this. So instead of solving for a squared here, we could have one that says b squared equals a squared plus c squared minus 2ac cosine big B. And the final version would be solving for c squared there. Um, c squared equals a squared plus, whoops, did not mean to erase that. Whoops, I'm going to put this back, a squared plus c squared there. c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine c. So those are the three different versions of the law of cosines, which is incredibly useful for us uh, doing all sorts of uh, math with non-right triangles, which show up just absolutely everywhere. 
finally today, I thought it'd be really cool if I shared with you this little diagram of the geometrical interpretation of sine, cosine, and other uh, trig functions. So it turns out that on a unit circle, a circle with a radius of one in whatever unit you're interested in, um, any trig function actually has a length that it's associated with. So here we have this angle theta defined um, from the center of the triangle. Again, it, it starts at the positive x-axis, just like we've always been doing here in physics. And we've just had this arbitrary angle. It's, it's whatever it is. I don't know, it looks sort of like a 50 or 60 degree angle here. Something, maybe a little bit more than that. The cosine of that angle, cosine of theta, is this exact length here, this little blue length. The sine of that angle is this length. And you can see that right triangle that we're used to. And this is kind of why sine goes with the opposite leg and cosine goes with the adjacent leg, is that it's associated with these two lengths. There's plenty of other uh, pretty strange trig functions going on here. The other one we use is tangent. Um, and tangent is this big, long, well, <laughs> nicely put, tan length. I like the way they did that in the diagram here. Um, from where your angle hits the edge of the circle down to out here where it hits the uh, x-axis, the positive x-axis. And you'll notice that the tangent is on a line relative to the circle that is actually tangent, meaning just touching the circle, only at the point where our angle hits the circle as well. The cotangent goes from that same point up to where the y-axis is. Um, and boy, there are some really strange other ones. You've probably heard of cosecant, uh, x secant, secant. Um, there's also the coversine, the versine, the x cosecant, uh, there's cotangent we mentioned, all sorts of really strange ones. There's like the x coversine, there's haversine, um, and actually the haversine formula, and I forget exactly where haversine is, oh there, it's half of versine, so haversine would be half of versine. The reason that there's a special name for this haversine is that it was super important in navigation. So back in the age of sail, before they had GPS, um, it was really important for them to know where they were. And you could figure out where you were north to south by looking at the stars at night, it's pretty simple, or even looking at the sun during the day. But knowing where you are east to west is almost impossible unless you have an extremely good clock. Um, so there's this thing called the Haversine formula that helped them, using a good clock, help them calculate exactly where they were on the globe in terms of coordinates and figure out uh, distances, in fact, between two points. Uh, so the Haversine formula used to be very important. And in fact, back then in the 1600s, 1700s, and probably even earlier than that, the Haversine formula and things like it, geometry uh, solutions like it, were considered so important that they were basically like nuclear secrets of the day. Uh, countries guarded them extremely jealously and would not let them uh, out if they had them. And of course, spies would try to steal them. So, you know, back in the day, even this kind of basic math was still pretty new and pretty exciting for people. And that's it for this week, everybody. Thanks so much, and I'll see you in Zoom. Have a good one.